Hi. My name is Michael Nuri. Hi. Hey. <laughs> nice to see you. And this is Bill Alderson. It's my teacher. So it's good to be here. Uh, we were just trying to figure out how long ago it was when Michael came to me. It was at the neighborhood playhouse. You no. came. Yes, it was. Was it? Yep. Wow, okay. And what he was doing at the time, uh, you were singing in coffee cafes, I believe, with your guitar. Yes. You had your guitar. Okay. You remember that? No. <laughs> well, that's how I remember it. Okay, good. Let's romanticize this. <laughs> I like your version. Uh, and we talked, you know, and... Uh, Was I trying to get into the playhouse? No. I wasn't there for any no. interview? Or? No, but you came there because I, I worked there, mm -hmm. and... I guess you called, and I said, well, can you come over at a certain time when I was in between classes, I guess, or on lunch? Okay. Uh, Kim did the same thing. She came there. Right. So they were in the, Kim Basinger and he were in the same class. Yeah. Catherine Grody. Mm -hmm. Jeff McCracken. Jeff McCracken. Al Pacino. <laughs> De Niro, Duval. <laughs> what happened to those guys? <clears throat> but that, I don't know, it was in the early 70s. Yeah. I was auditioning for a movie, and he was auditioning for the same movie. Dustin Hoffman? And at the time, he was teaching acting in a dance studio. So the the director of the movie, the writer of the movie, and the producers, he let them use the studio to hold auditions in. So the director uh, said, I want to see you do an improvisation. Okay. So he told Dusty, he told Dusty, you are... Uh, a dance teacher, and you have a group, and you're going on the road, and you advertised for a dancer. And then he talked to Dusty alone, and then he told me, he said, you're a dancer. He said, I don't care what you give yourself, but you've got to get this job. You've got to get this job. Okay, so we started, you know, we started improvising. And uh, I guess I knocked, and he, he said, you hear about the job, right? I said, how did you know? He said, well, you're here. I said, yes, I'm here. He said, well, come in. So he starts doing Okay, let me see you do some movement. Let me see you. Let me see you do some movement. You do this. And so I did that. And he said, Well, I can't. I can't. Uh, take off your jacket. Take off your jacket. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, do some more. <laughs> and he said, All right, look, take off your shirt. Take off your shirt. Oh, let's take off our shirt. This is Dustin? Dustin Hoffman? And you see where this is going. No. <laughs> we ended up in our un underwear because I had to get this job. Oh. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, he, he was... He was a gay dance teacher or uh, uh, instructor. <laughs> so we both got the job. 
<laughs> but he then he went and auditioned for the Boston Theater Company, and he got 32 weeks there. So that beat two or three weeks on this film. So he didn't take the film, but I did. As the dancer. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> the, direct, the director said, Bill, I didn't know you were that free. I said, I didn't know I was that free. <laughs> anyway, that's Dusty Hoffman. Yeah. So listen, I, I just want to say thank you for inviting me here. And uh, it's sure. really, I haven't seen Bill in, uh, it's been a couple of years, I think since I was here last time. And, uh, it's just really a treat to come here and to be among actors. And, uh, one of the things that Dustin talks about in this master class is the uh, <clears throat> importance of, he said, you know, in this, in this business, your greatest enemy is passivity. And you have got to get together with actors, whether it's to do poetry readings, whether it's to sit around and tell jokes, but to be together. So this is really a gift for me. It's an opportunity for me to be among my fellow actors and to uh, be reminded of really what it's, what it reminds me, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Because it's too fucking hard. It's the business part of it. Oh. It's too hard. Yeah. If there is not an element, an aspect of fun in it, forget about it. It's not worth it. So you gotta love it. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. Yeah. It's it's probably you 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 can't try to get into a tougher profession than acting. And no, 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 until finally someone says, maybe. Maybe, uh, let's see, and, and something happens. Yeah, you know, Hoffman talks about when he was working on Marathon Man with Olivier, and after, he was about two weeks into it, and they were having dinner in a restaurant, and uh, Dustin said he had graduated to calling him Larry. So he said, Larry, he said, why? Why do we do what we do? Why do we act? And he said, I was expecting this philosophical answer, like to elevate the human condition, <laughs> to enlighten people. And he said, Larry leaned in and he said to me, you want to know why we do this? It's this. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Please look at me. Look at me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Love, love, love. Yeah. Yeah. Please love me. Please. Yeah. I'll toot my flute for you. I'll take off my clothes for you. <laughs> you want a tomato? I can be a tomato. <laughs> <laughs> like in Tootsie, he said, Tomatoes don't walk. <laughs> oh, and the great story about when he's doing Tootsie that he talks about. And he's dressed as Dorothy. And uh, he gets into an elevator. He's had lunch at the Russian Tea Room. And he gets into an elevator with the AD of the movie. And, uh, and, and Jose Ferrer is in the elevator. Oh, yeah. You know the story? I think I do, but go ahead. So Jose Ferrer, he says, is even shorter than me. And that's short. But he was a giant in Dustin's mind because he had played you know, Academy Award for Kane Mutiny, which really, by all accounts, is one of the best monologues on film. When he comes in at the end, yeah. the drunken lawyer yeah. who has won the case. Yeah. Amazing. And then he played Toulouse Lautrec. And so, on. so he was a hero to Dustin Hoffman, who dresses Dorothy in the elevator with the AD. And he's, that's Dorothy, he's looking at, and I can't do the, the Dorothy voice. D-O-R-O-T-H-Y, I'm Dorothy. And Dorothy said, Mr. Farrell, I'm a huge fan of yours. 
And I never imagined that we'd be here in a, an elevator alone together, except for him. And, uh, I just, I don't know where you're getting off this elevator. I only have this moment and I want to seize this opportunity to just say something to you, may I? And in this response of the sonorous voice, yes. <laughs> may I suck your cock? <laughs> Straight faced. And he said that for right, just like looked straight ahead, couldn't wait for the door to open. He got off and said to the AD, Who is that fruitcake? Who is that? A year later, they were at an awards dinner. Farrar had heard who it was. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. totally enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. But Dustin said to him, I got you. Ah! I got you in that yeah. elevator, yeah. didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Fun. <laughs> What's this have to do with acting? What's this have to do with acting? Exactly. 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 I like this. You like this? I do like this. You do like this. I do like this. You do like this. Like this. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. Want to have a drink? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving you an out. <laughs> You remember that? The I repetition? Do. Of course I do. It's a great, it's, the repetition exercise is like uh, having a spare tire in the trunk when you get a flat. You know what I mean? You always know that it's there. <laughs> you know that if you get a flat on the road, yeah. you know that if you're going along in a scene and you go up, you just repeat what your partner is saying and it brings you right back. Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, if I get a flat tire, I'm okay. I've got a spare. I'll pull this out. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> what was it, the Broadway play you were in, and you were so nervous you couldn't remember your first line? Mm -hmm. It started with an A, didn't it? The, the play? Mm -hmm. A? No, it was... 40 Carats, 40 carats. with Julie Harris, Julie Harris and Nancy Marshall and Murray Hamilton and Abe Burroughs was directing it and Jimmy Burroughs was stage managing, James Burroughs. And... Um, it was your first Broadway show, right? That's my first show ever, mm -hmm. anything. And... Um, David Merrick was producing it, and it was opening night, and Catherine Hepburn was in the front row, Walter Kerr, Paul Newman, Joanne Woodward. And at that time, guys, black tie. Black tie. And, and every name he's mentioned at that time was big, big names in the business. Yeah. And it, there was this wonderful sense of <clears throat> occasion and respect for theater, uh, everything that Stella L. Adler talked about, having the respect for the theater, that you dress to go to the theater. The theater is a church, and actors and actresses are priests and priestesses, and whew, it was all of that. I think this is 1969. I mean, now people show up at the theater on opening night in, uh, God knows, it's, it's horrible. Sweats? Um, yeah, they do, in warm-up suits. But um, the music was, I was well rehearsed, and uh, the music, uh, the first scene takes place on an island in Greece, and Julie, Julie is stage right, and uh, her car has broken down, and I am uh, on the phone, speaking Greek, asking for help, and it's, I'm saying, Heneke etho, Heneke etho, woman, woman is here, and woman is here. Uh, and I couldn't remember my first line. 
the music is playing, the curtain is about to go up, and I said to Julie, and I, I crossed over to her, and I said, Julie, I can't remember, I can't remember my first line. I was terrified. I had never studied acting. I didn't know anything. I had just gotten this job by through through just balls. <laughs> And there I was starring uh, the lead role opposite the preeminent actress in theater, American actress. And, uh, God bless her. She's just that's I, we could we could talk for a long time just about the wonderfulness about. She was my first acting teacher as an actor. I learned more from her on stage in a year than I did from a lot of teachers that I've worked with. So she told me my line. And she said, sweetheart, just breathe. She told me my line. She said, just breathe. And she said, if it's any comfort to you, I just finished throwing up in my dressing room. I am so nervous. And I thought, really? Yeah. And she said, yes, dear. Yeah. It's all right. It's going to be fine. He, she said, just, just stay with me. Yeah. And we, we got through it. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, it's... It's uh, it's always a part of it, you know, the nerves, the nerves. You get used to it somewhat, and it doesn't get in your way anymore, but it's there. It does get in the way sometimes. Does it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then you have to... Uh, when it does get in the way, and if I go up on a line in the middle of the play, uh, I, I have stopped a show. Uh, <laughs> on stage? I, or On stage. On stage. Yeah, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I was doing a musical uh, in Chicago called Nefertiti. It was a musical about Nefertiti, and uh, opposite Andrea Marcovici, and we had Bobby Lapone. And... Uh, we had had Doc Simon come in to work on it, and it, there were a lot of problems with it. But it was this wonderful musical score, and they kept changing it, uh, trying to make it work. So the night before the opening night, uh, they had written a new opening number that I had to learn the night before. And I came out dressed as Horemhap, who was Akhenaten. The uh, Akhenaten was the, uh, 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 what do you call him? What was Akhenaten? He was, he was the general. Pardon me? Pharaoh. Thank you. Akhenaten was the pharaoh. And Horemhap was his general. And, and so I come in wearing a helmet and wearing a leather thing with boots and you know, all kinds of shit. And bum, 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 And the song is all about erasing every trace of Nefertiti because she betrayed him because she was in love with Akhenaten. <laughs> and Horemhap, the general, had fallen in love with her. But when Akhenaten died and she, he realized that she didn't love him and he couldn't have her, he decreed, mandated, that every trace of Nefertiti be erased from Egyptian history and culture. So I started singing, and the orchestra was going on at a clip. And uh, the Bobby Billig, who was the conductor, was down there, and he was conducting. And I'm looking at him, and I just completely vapor locked. I just forgot the words, and I realized that I was about eight measures behind. And there was no way to catch up. And Bobby, God bless him, was looking at me, mouthing the words frantically, trying to help me. And I looked at him, I thought, And you, you could feel the audience that every sphincter in the house was just like, <laughs> every was like oh my God. God, this is really bad, you know, and I just went, ladies and gentlemen, this is a new number, and uh, I'd like to start over, please indulge. Huge applause, because it let them off the hook. 
You know, it was like, oh, yes, okay. They loved it. Live theater. Anything can happen. And I think the uh, experience... So, Tony Bennett went to Sinatra, and he said, and Sinatra said, okay, kid, what can I do for you? In his dressing room, getting ready. And Tony Bennett said, Frank, I still get nervous when I sing. And Sinatra said, hey, don't worry about that. The American audience, they're very forgiving. Yes, they understand. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It's easy for Sinatra to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said, if I don't get nervous before I sing, I would be afraid. I would think something's wrong. Well, yeah, it's, it, that, that, that's, that's a very important thing, I think, that, uh, that, that fear. <sighs> Isn't it interesting that, you know, if we go back to look at me, look at me, look at me, if that's such a powerful motivation. And actors are so fucking brave to do it. Oh, yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's hard. Yeah. And you put yourself on the line. And have that fear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to have that fear and to show up. And I, I did a uh, self-taping that Sess helped me with this week in my home. And I, it's the first self-tape that I had ever done. And I was really nervous and I felt self-conscious. And, uh, and I looked at it. Sess, where are you? All right. Yeah, I looked at it uh, and I thought, oh, God, this is not very good. And anyway, we, we, we submitted it. But the point is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get it. I'm not, I'm not going to get that gig. No, no I don't think so. <laughs> but to have that f fear, I, 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 I think it's absolutely true that the nerves, you break it down, what are nerves? It's certainly, it's fear. It's wanting to do things right. There are so many components that conspire against doing what it is about achieving our objective. Uh, which is to be in the moment, right? Yeah. So if I'm afraid, if I'm coming from fear, I am certainly everywhere but in the moment. I'm thinking about every other conceivable place I would rather be. <laughs> uh, God, and I think that that is what is so exhilarating. Here's a good one. I'm at Carnegie Hall with um, Patrick Stewart, uh, with B.B. Newirth. And we have Queen Noor of Jordan, Jordan in the audience, and a lot of dignitaries. And it was for some benefit. And each one of us was going to go out and, and perform something. And I was going to sing. And here I am at Patrick Stewart. We're talking about, in the wings, about how nervous we all are. And I thought, Patrick Stewart is nervous. Said, He's talking about what? Patrick Stewart said he was nervous. Yeah. B.B. North said, she said, why do we do this? Why do we do this? And then the curtain came down at the end of the evening, and we all looked at each other and we said, this is why we do this. <laughs> this is why we do it. This is the cookie. Yeah. This is the reward. But uh, there are not, it takes a very special breed of, of a certain character to, to want to do this, and especially stage, because it's so vulnerable. And for those of you who sing, especially for singers, because singing is particularly, it's doubly vulnerable, because vul singing really opens up your heart. Doing dialogue can be intellectual. Uh, ideally, we, sh we, we, we don't want to be just coming from our intellect when we're acting. We want to have our heart engaged. We want to have our intellect engaged and everything. But I'll tell you something, in singing, for those of you who sing and have done musical theater, you know what I'm talking about. you got to be, you're leading with your heart. Uh, I, I think it was George S. Kaufman who says, or, and it wasn't George S. Kaufman, it was, somebody, it was Josh Logan who said, song is what happens when you run out of words and you have to sing, mm -hmm. and when your heart takes over. Mm -hmm. That's where music should come from. It should come right from the heart. Uh, wow, okay, so. <laughs>
and 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 when you're in love, you hear songs that you've heard before, and all of a sudden, you understand them. You never understood them before, but suddenly, you. I'm, I'm thinking of popular, lo, you know, love songs that you hear on the radio. Yeah, like, I'm so miserable without you, it's almost like having you around. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> no, but those writers who yeah. you know who write those those love songs, man, they know what they're talking about. So much chanted evening. Yeah. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it. Would you like to hear him sing? Yeah. yeah. Right. <clears throat> you can stand if you want. Mm, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it reminds me of the opening of Dustin's uh, master class where whoever's directing it says, uh, uh, Dustin, you can say, uh, I'm Dustin Hoffman, and this is my master class. And he said, I know, but I might give it a different reading. You remember? <laughs> but you know, rather than perform it, I'd like to uh, uh, communicate it. Want a girl? Mm -hmm. Always. <laughs> <laughs> you want a beautiful girl to sing it to? No, I, I, I would like to you sing it. That. I would like to sing it to Oh okay. <clears throat> Some enchanted evening. You may see a stranger You may see a stranger Across a crowded room And somehow you know You know even then That somewhere you'll see her Again and again Some enchanted evening, someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing across a crowded room. And night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of her laughter will sing in your dreams. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? <laughs> Fools give you reasons. Wise men never try. Some enchanted evening when you find your true love, when you feel her call you across a crowded room, then fly to her side and make her your own or all through your life you may dream all along once you have found her never let her go once you have found her never let her Sweetness, 
sweetness. The heart is made of sweetness. Julie Harris, the embodiment of sweetness. And I've worked, I've had the, the pleasure and honor of working with wonderful people. But the people who have really made a difference in my life and touched me, um, the people who are my teachers in life are those who embrace sweetness and, you know, I wanted to, I was thinking on the way over here, just to say, in, I'm thinking about why are we here? Why are we here tonight? I was watching Anthony Bourdain, who was interviewing Iggy Pop on his show, and he said to Iggy at the end of the interview, he said, after all that you've done, man, you've been all over the world, it's like you're successful with money and fame and all of that. What matters to you in life? What's the most important thing to you in life? And Iggy says, it may sound corny, but it's being loved and appreciating those who make me feel loved. And the older I get, that's the bottom line. So what brings me here on a Friday night is my love for you. Thank you. My wanting to feel you're welcome. And my wanting to feel that I belong somewhere, that I have a purpose. Anytime. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I just signed up to, to mentor a young actors in the inner city, uh, downtown at 24th Street Theater. So I need to belong. I need to, you're asking me why I'm here. And uh, it's, it's, it's to give. It's to give. And, 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 I don't realize that I have something to give until there is a vessel or vessels in front of me that are receiving. And then I realize, wow, yeah, I've got some stuff to give. This is really cool. I have 50 years of experience in this business and um, a lot of pain, a lot of frustration, a lot of sadness, a lot of exasperation, a lot of times where I thought, why am I doing this? Why do I keep doing this? Why don't I just you know, call it a day? You love it. I do love it. Yeah. I do love it. And I'm stubborn. And what? I'm stubborn. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> do you? Can you give me an example of how I was stubborn? No, I don't. I, don't. <laughs> I did this television movie with Sinatra in New York in 1977. It's called Contract on Cherry Street. And he, uh, I played a young detective. And um, the first day of, when I told my mom that I was working with Frank Sinatra, my mom was a, I don't know if you know what a bobby soxer was, but a bobby, so bobby soxers were girls in their teens who used to wear white socks and patent leather shoes. And, they would scream. They were the ones who would scream and cry the way the girls did with the Beatles. And so my mom was a Bobby Soxer, and she was a, a, just a crazy fan for Frank. Sinatra did that to them, what Elvis did to later. Exactly. And so when I told mom that, uh, that I was working with Frank, she was just all it's so excited. And I asked permission to invite her to the set to meet Frank, and she, she did. She came the first day, and, um, and my mom made the best granola, and she put it in a ball jar, and, 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 and she, she called it Graniola. And she wrote on the label, she said, for, for Frank, with love, from Gloria, Graniola. And when she met him, he gave her the biggest hug, and she just melted. <laughs> so we did the movie, and then Frank had this <clears throat> God, it's amazing. We shot it in Little Italy, and uh, we we did the we did the film. Uh, it was about a month of working, and uh, then he had this rap party to end all rap parties. Uh, he bussed everybody, cast, crew, family, out to. Uh, uh, some place where we had a, a concert, he gave a concert, open air concert. And I took my mom, she was my date, and we held hands, uh, 
watching Frank sing. And then we were bused back to the Waldorf Towers, where there was uh, in a ballroom with an ice sculpture that was the width of the stage. It said Frankie. It was melting. <laughs> and there was every describable food, kind of food, available for everybody. Frank was in a VIP section up there that was roped off. And he had Julie, who was his lifelong bodyguard, with him. So it wound down, and, uh, and people were starting to leave. And nobody was going over to thank him for, for the party or the concert. Well, that just wasn't my upbringing. You, know, you thank your host. And I also did not feel intimidated because I had worked with him in all fairness to the people who were intimidated. It's very understandable. He is an intimidating and imposing figure. So we went over to the rope, and Jilly took the rope down and welcomed us in. And Frank gave Mom a hug, and he gave me a hug. And that's when he said to Mom what he did. And he, he said some very complimentary things to my mom that just had me on a cloud for weeks. Just, <laughs> he said, Michael is one of the finest actors I've ever worked with and uh, and so that was, was really the same he mentioned Mont Monty Clift uh, so that was that was very very generous of him and I have to remember that when I'm going to auditions <laughs> <laughs> thank you for reminding me yeah I should go into an audition and say do you know what Frank Sinatra said <laughs> Um, I, I worked recently with a wonderful actor named Brian Cox, and he's one of my favorite actors. Do you know who he is? He said, you know what it takes to be in this business, Michael? And I said, what? Balls. Balls. You've got to have balls to be in this business. You've got to have balls to be in the business. You've got to have balls to take the rejection. You've got to have balls to, 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 to say uh, what you believe. You have to have balls to stand up to a director not in a cavalier way, not in an arrogant way. I was talking to a friend of mine, a very fine actor, English actor, last week. I was asking him how he prepares for auditions. And he said, I prepare, I really prepare. I learn the lines. Uh, and if I'm going to meet a director, I research that director about him about his politics, about his personal likes and dislikes and so on, so that I can have a conversation with him, so that I can connect with him as a, as a person. And then I look at the character and I try to find something. I try to imagine how most people would do this, play this part, audition for this part. And I want to go in a completely different direction. That's about balls not wanting to be liked. We've, we've really got to get rid of that one. That is an actor's single greatest enemy. Isn't it ironic that the reason that we get into this business and do what we do is the very thing that will destroy us and keep us from having the career that we want? Mm -hmm. We have to completely get rid of wanting to be liked because it is the antithesis of truth. It is the enemy of truth. Every great person, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, throughout history, you just pick these people. Their mission in life was to tell the truth, and they were willing to sacrifice their lives for it. That is the length to which they were willing to go. Those were the stakes that they were playing for. And I want to suggest that it's no different for actors. Those are the stakes that we need to play for. We have to, when we get on the stage, it's like Stella said, you don't walk on that stage unless you feel your life depends on it. Your life depends on every fucking moment that we're on stage. And uh, was it who said, you know, hit your marks and tell the truth. It was, uh, Spencer Tracy. Sounds so simple. What's the key to acting? And he said, hit your marks and tell the truth. But what goes into getting to the place where you have the balls to tell the truth? 
is the homework. It's all the preparation so that you have a concrete point of view that is all yours and only yours. That you have taken your interpretation of that character. Of course, you, you, you take into consideration the, the author's point of view. But you're making it your own. And have the courage to make it your own and give it your own interpretation. We are interpretive artists, right? So be bold enough to interpret the material and put your own unique thumbprint on it. I love this. I love being here tonight. <laughs> yeah. You've worked with some uh, pretty impressive directors over the years, like Gus Van Zandt, uh, Spielberg, Adrian Lyne. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, you know, the list is pretty long. I'm wondering with whom you've had some of your better experiences. I, I worked with Stephen once, and uh, it was a, a, a scene in, in uh, the, uh, what was it called? The Terminal with Tom Hanks. All I had to do was be at the top of an escalator and kiss Catherine Zeta-Jones when she came up the top. And Stephen said, um, I just want you to, she comes up to the top, I want you to kiss her, and I'm not going to direct you, just, I wish I were in your place. And, <laughs> so we did it, and she came up the escalator, and I picked her up, and picked her up, I picked her right up, planted one on her. Stephen said that was great. Good. Next. I said, Stephen, um, I, can, I, can, I can do it better. <laughs> he said, okay, let's do another one. And so she goes down the bottom of the stairs, picked her up, kissed her. She's got nice lips. He said, that's good. That was a little, that was a different good night. It's, Three. He gave me three takes. <laughs> he knew what I was about. <laughs> so I like Stephen. Um, Adrian Lyne was wonderful. He's a friend of mine. He's become a, a, a really dear friend of mine. Um, uh, very quirky. Really quirky. Id idiosyncratic. But a real artist. A real kind of painter. Um, who is that? Adrian Lyne, who direct, uh, directed Flashdance. Gus Van Zandt was lovely, um, lovely. Uh, on, I've worked with him twice, and uh, and he was he was lovely to work with, uh, and uh, yeah, it was about this young black kid in school who had a scholarship, and Sean Connery. <laughs> Sean Connery was in this movie. What was the name of that movie? Finding Forrester. Fi Finding Forrester. <laughs> So Gus said to me, he, he said, I, I understand you, you do an impersonation of Sean Connery. And I said, well, you know, come on, Gus. Yeah. He said, would you do it for the crew? Well, that was like putting a knife in a monkey's hand. I go to the wardrobe people. They dress me up in a kilt. I put on a kilt. I went to the prop people. I got a golf bag, and I filled it with bottles of J&B. And I had them powder my hair. I had them make me look as much like Sean Connery did in the character, as, as, in the role as, 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 as Forrester. <laughs> and I walked onto the set, and uh, F. Murray Abraham was, uh, was, was doing a scene. And, and, and so I walk on, onto the set, and uh, Gus is over there behind the camera, and he goes, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I, 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 I walked on. <laughs> <laughs> and Gus is behind the camera like this, and he's going, and, and, and F. Murray Abraham turns and looks at me and says, like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> what do you mean, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> so, what kind of name is F. Murray Abraham? Like, How do you say your name? Is F. F. Murray? <laughs> and they started laughing. They started like, what the fuck are you all laughing about? I'm producing this goddamn movie. And you're all sitting there laughing with your thumbs up your asses. I said, get back to fucking work. And they're laughing and laughing and laughing. And I ran out of material. I was just drying up. It was just fun. But they were laughing and laughing and laughing. And then I realized that they were laughing at something that was disproportionate with what I was doing. You know where this is going. And, no I, underwear. and I, hear behind, I hear behind me, I hear behind me, 
Show, Mr. Nore. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> having, having fun at my expense, shall we? <laughs> I swear, I turned around, I spun around, I said, Who the fuck are you? Get off of my set! <laughs> I got him. I got him. It was great. The unapproachable Sean Connery. So that was that was a great moment. So you know you can have a lot of opportunities. You know on film sets you become family when you uh, you know if we're lucky enough to do films and we're on sets for a period of time we become family and and we you, you cut up and you have fun and you laugh and it's really it's a shitload of fun to get paid for what you love to do. It's a lot of fun and you know catering and you have your own trailer and it's wonderful and then the next gig you know you're working in Sarajevo for nothing for scale you know eating pork rind it's crazy this business you Plus, sang beautifully tonight uh, if you had the opportunity would you do uh, another musical that be something you would or will. Oh, yes. I mean, you have a gorgeous voice. I, I, I just never knew that. Phil Thank told me that you, before this started, that you were a singer. It was wonderful to hear you sing tonight. Thank you. Do you sing? Yeah, I do. I do. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And yeah, I really look forward to singing a lot more and doing musicals. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You bet. What was the... <clears throat> you were doing... Uh, South Pacific. Yes. And you, you, uh, I was with some friends, and you said you would come out, but you were back in your dressing room because uh, the, the hills are alive with the sound of music. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews and her husband. And Blake Edwards. Mm -hmm. They were backstage in his dressing room mm -hmm. uh, asking him if he wanted to do Victor Victoria. Victor Victoria on, on Broadway. Yes. And they did ask you, yes, right? Yes. And you did it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing South Pacific at the... Uh, um, uh, Long Beach. Long Beach, that's right, at Long Beach yeah. with Sandy Duncan. Yeah. And uh, uh, having a wonderful time. And, um, uh, and, and I was on my way to a matinee uh, down there, and I stopped off at a restaurant in Brentwood to get some food. And... Uh, uh, Tony Adams, who was Blake's pro producing partner, uh, walked over to me and he said, have you ever met, he introduced himself, have you ever met Blake Edwards? And I said, no, no, I haven't, but I'm a, just a huge fan. And he said, would, would you like to meet him? And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, come on, follow me. And I went over and uh, Blake was sitting there and, 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 and he said, <laughs> he, said Do you, he said, do you sing? And I said... Does your dig bite? <laughs> so a line from Pink Panther. And he liked that. I said, does your dog bite? You know, yeah, that is not my dog. Yeah. And, and I said, yeah, he told me the story about that. Do, do, do you know the scene I'm talking about? Peter Sellers puts on a rubber nose and he's going in as a dentist to see Herbert Lom and he's gonna and he goes in and and and, and, and he goes to the the clerk there and 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 uh, the clerk is smoking a meerschaum pipe and uh, and there's a dog down, down there and uh, so Peter Peter Sellers says to the clerk who's puffing away on this meerschaum pipe he says does your dig bites <laughs> And the guy, without saying anything, puffing on the mission goes. And then Peter Sellers starts to move, and the dog attacks him and starts biting him. <laughs> he says, I thought you said your dog it does not bite. And the guy goes, that is not my dog. <laughs> so I said to Blake, I said, I was laughing so hard, I was slamming my head on the seat in front of me in the theater. I said, that's so fucking funny. He said, well, I'll tell you what we did. In that in, the, in that in that scene, he told me he said there's a wonderful old English actor uh, with the pipe, who was the clerk, and we were shooting <laughs> we were shooting we started shooting that at ten o'clock in the morning, and I filled his pipe with hashish, <laughs> and I said I need a lot of smoke I want I want a lot of smoke just really smoke it up if you see the show again you'll see. He said, 
The guy was totally fucked up. He was, he was high as a kite. <laughs> so how did I get to that? Oh yeah. So um, so I, I, I said to Blake. I, he, he said, uh, "Would you? We want to do Victor Victoria on Broadway, and uh, I'd love you to audition. Would you be willing to audition?" Uh, I said, "Absolutely." Um, I, and I said, "I'm doing South Pacific down in, in Long Beach, and I'd love to have you come and see that." So, light bulb. I think. Okay, get a limo, get them down there, let that be your audition. He's going into an audition room with a fucking upright piano, blah, blah, blah. Here's a golden opportunity for them to see me really doing my stuff. Okay. And they did, and I thought maybe they would uh, uh, stay for the first act, but they stayed for the whole thing, and they came backstage afterwards. And of course, Sandy Duncan and everybody was a buzz with, oh my God, Julie. Andrews is in the audience. Julie Andrews is in the audience. Oh, God. And came backstage and she's so gracious, that woman. Oh, my God. She said hello. She greeted every single member of the cast and the company. She was brilliant. And then Blake came up to me and he said, he put his hand out and he said, let's go to Broadway. Hmm. Nice. And that was two years. Two years of working with Julie Andrews and Blake Edwards. Three months on the road before Broadway, and then, and then a year and a half on Broadway uh, with Julie, and then she started having vocal problems, and Liza Minnelli came in for her, so I got to work with Liza Minnelli, which was a whole other amazing experience. And with Greg Jabara, I don't know if you know, he's a fabulous actor, and Rachel York, and Tony Rob and Tony Roberts. Mm. I mean, it's just amazing, and, and, and royalty. Mm. Came to see that show. Mm -hmm. I mean, actual royalty mm -hmm. of you know from all over the world, and they had to get past my dressing room to, to see. So I was like, oh. <laughs> uh, it was so cool. It was really cool. And then when Liza came in, a whole different audience came in. The whole gay community came in. So that was that was very cool. And Chris Walken came, and De Niro came, and because they all came to see their pal Liza, you know. So that was yeah, that was a. That was a cool experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on my 50th birthday, which happened to fall on a Wednesday, uh, on a matinee day, curtain goes down, curtain goes back up, and this birthday cake the size of this table was wheeled out onto the stage. Wow. Compliments of Julie. And she led the orchestra and the entire audience and singing happy birthday to Oh, me. that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> I lost it. I just, I lost it. Bill said to me in class one time, he said, you know, I mean, the high praise from Bill, as we all know, is that was quite okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite okay. It was, it was quite okay. I don't know if he, do you still say that? Yeah. 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 I say, okay. Yeah. You say, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, that makes you want to go, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so he said to me once in class, I, I think I was doing a scene with, I don't know, Kim Basinger or somebody, and, and uh, <laughs> he says, you know, Michael, the thing about you is, I'll never forget this, Bill. Uh, and it serves me well. He said, you're like somebody who would put on two raincoats to go outside in the rain. You only need one. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I thought, what the fuck is this <laughs> asshole talking about? <laughs> but he was absolutely right. He, 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 he nailed it. He called me out. He said, you know, just do less. You don't have to. You don't have to do all of that. Just be simple. When did you uh, know you wanted to become an actor? Um, what did he say? When did I know that I wanted to become an actor? Um, I wanted to rescue my family. 
I wanted to save my parents and keep them from breaking up. How old were you? Nine, ten. I was nine, too. Yes. Clearly, I wasn't thinking, wow, I want to be an actor. I wanted to save my world from falling apart. So I would try to be funny, uh, antics, goofy, and would take my mom's hand and walk over to my dad and I would literally put their hands together and say, come on. You know? And I learned guitar and studied guitar and would play for them and be the entertainer in the house. And there are probably, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who has a similar story. Dustin Hoffman talks about that very thing in his family, about how his father was a tyrant and would yell at his mother, and he was terrified. He grew up feeling terrified in his family, not feeling safe. I didn't feel safe in my family. I am now always looking for an environment where I feel safe. And so, as I said before about feeling a place to belong. Um, now, to answer your question about when did I know that I wanted to be an actor, um, I don't think I ever said to myself, I want to be an actor. No, it didn't happen like that. It was like, before I knew it, I was on Broadway. And then I did one of the biggest movies of the 1970s uh, called Goodbye Columbus. I had a small, small part in it. Uh, I just showed up because of my chutzpah I, and because I didn't, I didn't know the obstacles. Uh, and I was just doing it. Before I knew it, I was doing it. And before I knew it, I had been into it for 10 years. And I was into it for 20 years, and 30 years. And you know, it wasn't until Damages, which was, what, six years ago, seven years ago? I was really, uh, uh, haunted by doubts about my ability and my confidence. This is after having been on Broadway with Julie Andrews. This is after having done 40 years, but there was something that was so validating because I, there was something about working with Glenn Close that sent me the message that I belong here. I said to myself, I, I didn't get this job because of charity. I got this gig because I belong here. And uh, that was a turning point in my life. Just recently, that's like seven years ago, <laughs> after being in the business for 35 years. You know, there's, there's something else that we should, I should bring up. If you look like him, It makes a difference. <laughs> when he, you know, you studied with me for two years, and I went to see Flashdance, and you came on the screen, and I went, whoa! He's so fucking handsome! <laughs> came on the screen. Whoa! Is that Michael? <laughs> and you so so together. It seemed. Yeah. It seemed. It seemed. It seemed. Yeah. So in control. It seemed. It seemed. Yeah. Yeah. The 
excuse me, I just want to throw this in. One other thing. When I was nine, my mother, we were living out in the rural area, and my mother said, well, I'm marrying, I'm marrying again. You know, I, I didn't have a father. And she said, I'm marrying Phil. And, oh, okay. And we're moving to San Francisco. The San Francisco, where's San Francisco? She said, it's in California. And I said, is Hollywood in California? <laughs> and she said, yes, it is. And I walked outside in this rural area, and I looked up at the sky, and the sky was popped with stars. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be an actor. That's true. Isn't that something? That's true. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> keep going. So uh, thanks for the compliment. And. I get no sense of fulfillment for something that I cannot take credit for. Okay. Okay. I'm grateful to have been blessed with looks. Looks, good looks, can also be an impediment. Uh, you can be perceived in a certain way. I, I'll tell you, I, the roles that I get now are far more interesting than the ones that I got when I was a young leading man. Uh, much juicier roles, you know. And also, I didn't know myself then. Mm -hmm. I was not really you know, self-reflective or, you know, and... What and was the name of the TV show, your TV show, where you had two Dobermans? Oh, my God. Nick and the Dobermans. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were a detective, or...? I was Nick. I, I know, but... I was a, de a detective. Detective, yeah. Who used Dobermans. To, to solve crime. <laughs> you, you have an extraordinary... They thought really hard about that title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, God, it was so silly. Yeah, but, uh, you know, the thing about looks, uh, Dustin Hoffman is not considered a handsome man. No. But, my God... You can't take your eyes off of him. I was watching um, The Graduate recently. Oh. Holy fuck. He's 27 years old. He was playing Benjamin, who was 18. Just I thought he was 30. He's 27. 27. Yeah. And he said to Mike Nichols, he said, I'm too old for this part, and you're looking for a waspy guy. I'm Jewish. And that. he said, no. He kind of almost tried to talk himself out of it. But you know, I was just watching his work in The Graduate. And I don't know if you remember him in the opening scenes. He's on a conveyor. First of all, he's on a plane. He's sitting on a plane. And it's just him, and he is so still. He's just staring. And it's the introduction to his whole inner life right there in that first shot on the plane. And you're going, wow, what's going on with this guy? It was like that through the whole thing, and that is his, that's his gift, that's, and also the work. He works very, very hard yeah. at what he does. Yeah. But, you know, no, he is not considered a handsome guy, but wow, is he great. Gene Hackman is not considered a handsome guy, but wow, you know. Um, to, to rely on looks is a very slippery slope to live on. Um, no, 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 no. I don't want to be thought of as, you know, given a chance between how I would like to be regarded and perceived, I, w I would really much rather have the respect of my, my, my peers and my colleagues as a, as, as a good actor rather than a, uh, you know, it's meaningless. Are we cooked? Thank you, yeah.